Jones on KLRB. <laughs> it's time once again for Dialogue Conspiracy with political research specialist May Brussel, who for five years shared with us her extensive research into political assassinations sure. and abuses of power in this country. Her program relates the news of the week to emerging evidence about the conspiracy which allegedly maintains by force its control of the legislative, executive, and judicial processes in America. And now, May Brussel. Good afternoon. This is May Brussel in Carmel, California. It's Dialogue Conspiracy number 253, and it's January the 24th, 1977. Another beautiful day in Carmel, California. I'm going to talk today on Dialogue Conspiracy about um, the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderbergers, Jimmy Carter, and the IBM, the new administration. We now take the conspiracy off the back of Gerald Ford and Richard Nixon and move on to the transition team with Jimmy Carter in the White House and see how he handles the ongoing and planned future conspiracies. The Washington Post had an article this week, it was in our Monterey Herald 2, a large story on the Trilateral Commission and Jerry, Jimmy Carter's relationship to that organization, and we'll talk about it a little bit. And the article began in this way. It said, Carter relies heavily on the trilateralists, little known and controversial group. If you like conspiracy theories about secret plots to take over the world, you're going to love the administration of President Jimmy Carter. Right-wingers are going to go bananas over it, so are the left-wingers. It looks to them like the apocalyptic piece of evidence that fits every wacky puzzle, the missing link in every weird scenario. Trilateralists are not three-sided people. They are members of a private, though not secret, international organization put together by the wealthy banker David Rockefeller to, in quotes, stimulate dialogue between Western Europe, Japan, and the United States. The main agents in Western Europe are Prince Bernhard in Belgium and, of course, the Japanese government, the, the recipients of the Lockheed scandals and the $100,000 units that were titled peanuts uh, through the whole Lockheed scandal but have not been investigated. That is the trilateral Japan, uh, Belgium, and the United States, meaning that Prince Bernhard can handle uh, the Western part of Europe as a bulwark against Soviet Union and communism. Japan handles and keeps an eye on South Korea, the Philippines, Laos, Cambodia, and Southeast Asia against communist China. And the United States can keep a handle on and control of Canada, South, and Central America. And these three great forces can mark out a pattern on the globe and very easily control the entire world in terms of food, labor, health, and the economy. They've worked this out quite well and have a pretty good control over the situation with their man, Jimmy Carter, now in the White House. Well, Gerald Ford is still on the Monterey Peninsula. He came here right after the ceremony of Jimmy Carter, and I watched that on television, watched his departure. I want to have a few words to share with you on the air about that because it was really quite an experience the way the setting was that he left Washington, D.C. after serving there for 28 years. But when I came to KLRB today, I had a fantasy that Jerry and Betty had been out playing golf all day and went into their home and flipped on a radio and decided to have a little music before dinner and just happened to catch Dialogue Conspiracy and uh, wondered who was talking about me, what in the hell is going on at that radio station. I'm sure he does not know about me, Brussel, and I'm sure the local community does not tell Jim, uh, Jerry Ford when he's here that there is such a program or that somebody is accusing him week after week of covering up the Warren Commission hearings of lying in his book, taking evidence from the agents of Nazi intelligence agent Reinhard Galen and using those agents as the source of information about Lee Harvey Oswald, making his book, The Mind of the Assassin, a totally false book, not based upon hard evidence at all. And, of course, we talk about uh, the remarks District Attorney Jim Garrison said in New Orleans that Gerald Ford was the best congressman the CIA ever had. Jerry Ford uh, covered up Watergate. He went to the Patent Committee in, in Congress to stop the investigation of the Mexican money. 
and pardoned Richard Nixon and kept the lid on the investigations of the killing of J. Edgar Hoover or the killing of Dorothy Hunt or Mary Jo Kopechny and the shooting of George Wallace. And he was a very efficient president. He had Leon Jaworski there and as an investigator, as Richard Nixon did, and Gerald Ford was appointed as the vice president by Richard Nixon, just as he was put on the Warren Commission by Richard Nixon. But uh, I'm sure that he's totally unaware that about five miles from where he's staying, there is this radio station, KLRB, that does go in great lengths to describe some of the various things that should remove him from office when he held office and should be investigated, even though he has retired from that office. The scene of the departure was very weird. I watched it on television. He took a helicopter with Nelson Rockefeller and Happy Rockefeller and Betty, and they went out to Andrews Air Force Base. And I don't know how many of you saw that on your television screen, but several friends called me and had the same eerie feeling that I had about it after being in office 28 years in Washington. They were alone out at this field, and the backdrop, it was a scene like a Fellini movie, Eight and a Half, or an Antonio movie. The backdrop was totally bare. There was a sun, sunny sky, an airplane, Air Force One, and Gerald Ford was going to get into the airplane that John Kennedy had flown and his body had taken back to Washington after he was dead. And he was to take this Air Force One and take it out to Monterey, California. And they had a red carpet out at this barren airfield. And there, you could hardly see there was no uh, crowd there, nobody around. And he said that he wanted the kind of departure that Lyndon Johnson had. And there were cannons out there and gun salute and this red carpet and nobody on the field except the four of them. And they had a band playing their farewell. And the Rockefellers saw um, Jerry Ford off. The two Rockefellers, that they played the Star Spangled Banner, two had their hands to their chest and two didn't, I believe, uh, Gerald Ford and... Happy Rockefeller did, Mrs. Ford and Nelson Rockefeller weren't pledging or putting their hands to their chest. And the four of them were lined up, but it reminded me of the movie of Idi Amin, if you've seen it, where he reviews his troops in uh, Uganda. And it, they were standing there all by themselves. A band was playing, and then Betty and Jerry got onto this airplane and flew out to California. It, left me in such a weird feeling that I felt I had to see it arrive to see if it was real and we did go out to the airport in Monterey to watch them uh, get off that airplane and I felt that part of history of this man interwoven with the Kennedy assassination of the airplane and being um, acclaimed verbally by everybody as being so kind and gentle and allowing this assassination of Kennedy to be in his hands to be investigated and covering it up and nobody ever really had the guts in the major news media to say the role that he had in covering up. It was no different than what Richard Nixon did at Watergate and he did it a few years earlier and the team stayed intact all these years and it was a, quite a jumble of thoughts in my mind as I saw him leave Washington and realize that part of those Kennedy years were over the Warren Commission member who was then President of the United States and now out of office, but also knowing that while he was departing, a new president was having lunch in the White House, Jimmy Carter, and that the old team had a firmer handle on Jimmy Carter than maybe the other team or just as firm, and that nothing has changed. And the transition was eerie because Nelson Rockefeller and Happy were the only people there when Jerry and Betty left, and when they left, uh, David Rockefeller then not visible at the White House having lunch, had a very firm control on Jimmy Carter. His trilateral commission that we'll talk about from time to time, and I ta I've talked about before in KLRB, went down and handpicked Jimmy Carter to run for president of the United States. So when one Rockefeller sees Jerry Ford off, his brother David Rockefeller, who's even more powerful, if that is possible, and actually the king of the empire, has a very firm control with his trilateral commission and a new team on the new president of the United States. If Jimmy Carter was handpicked by David Rockefeller, uh, this is the era of David and Coca-Cola and the Navy intelligence, of course, always runs through this with his experience at Annapolis. And Jerry Ford and the Nixon team were the Pepsi-Cola team and the Nelson Rockefeller uh, fellows had control of them there. I, 
after uh, Carter selected his cabinet and he was busy on this for the last month, uh, it turned out that the cabinet is stacked, overwhelmingly stacked, with people from IBM, the International Business Machine Company, and also from the Trilateral Commission. And because of so many of these people, it's such a gross, overt act of stacking this body, I thought I would talk about the IBM hold on the government and also, if we have time, on the trilateral today. The IBM machine, uh, the international business machine, has been under investigation by the Justice Department since January of 1969, and this is now 1977. They were able to stall this antitrust suit until they had a president of their choice in the White House, and IBM uh, seems to be even larger than our Justice Department and even our government. In being able to handle it, it would be an impossibility, and now they have a president that can take care of their needs to continue when the suit gets really heavy. But the IBM has been under investigation by from the Justice Department since 1969. There's been a litigation, an antitrust litigation, claiming that they're too powerful. They control almost all of the computer industry, about 80% of the entire computer industry of the United States, including all our defense and weapon and military computers and education system. They sell the hardware, the computer machine, and the software, the paper, and the inks, and the repair for their computers, and those are the servicemen that come and fix them or read them, and therefore no other competing computer companies can equal the IBM or even stay in business, even though it's a field like broadcasting or newspapers or any other competitive field, drugs or whatever, that should be able to compete with one other company named IBM. So the litigation began when 23 uh, parties, 23 subscribers, um, uh, companies filed a suit against IBM and the government went into the antitrust investigation of this. There's a daily, day-by-day -day account of the courtroom events that's been going on since 1969, as I say, and there are tw one dozen, there's 12 computer companies that have filed an antitrust suit through the government against this large operation. It started six years ago under Lyndon Johnson's administration when Attorney General Ramsey Clark signed the complaint. And at the time the antitrust suit went against the IBM, uh, it re read uh, part of Clark's uh, statement about it, said the computers seemed like a key, not only because of their size and the growing industry, but because of their impact on all other industries. You see, the computer uh, does arrange certain uh, effects of oil industries and minerals and the narcotic field and the medical field and prescriptions and satellite communications and going into banking and control of money or the social security money coming in checks. Every aspect of our economy and our life or defense is tied up in computers and um, this seemed like something that they should go into. Now, the Justice Department, since 1969, has spent $4 million of our tax money on this law case so far, and there is no end in sight because the IBM is so large, and when we need money for other uh, things in this country, schools or education or health or schools for the blind or better mental hospitals and um, ombudsmen in the prisons or whatever, there's a list a mile long of things that we need, low-cost housing and so forth. Uh, there's never any money. But just investigating this case alone, since 69, the government has put in $5 million. They have a staff of 21 full-time attorneys, 25 full-time personnel, 20 part-time attorneys, and the suit is called U.S. versus IBM. So far in this suit, they've used up 6 billion sheets of paper, 700 miles high. The documents go 700 miles high, and I have to warn you that what I say about this IBM case, and I bring it up, as I say, because Jimmy Carter has uh, put his staff of uh, mainly IBM people into the cabinet. I'm going to some very gross figures today on Dialogue Conspiracy, and I hope that you will find them as interesting and as grotesque as I have. Six billion dollars sheets of paper, which is approximately, as I say, seven a hundred miles high on this lawsuit since 1969. The government has called 34 witnesses in the past 17 months 
and they have yet 470 more to appear. I might tell you before we go into the antitrust suit on IBM about Jimmy Carter's cabinet, and uh, these figures are just a summary. Uh, they were run down briefly by William Sapphire in the New York Times January the 14th, just this last week at the completion of the Jimmy Carter um, appointments. And Sapphire said, never in American political history is one corporation so completely dominated the top level of any administration. If this had been a Republican administration and the company were I, such as ITT stacked the cabinet, would there be such genial tolerance? Could the Republicans get away with it the way Jimmy Carter is doing? For example, Cyrus Vance, the new Secretary of State appointed by Jimmy Carter, is the director of IBM, a member of its executive committee. Now, as I read these off, these cabinet members, keep in mind, as I say, that there's this litigation going on, this antitrust suit that's been going on since 1969 that involves hundreds of millions of dollars. And while this litigation is taking place, this is the cabinet that Jimmy Carter appointed. Again, Cyrus Vance, Secretary of State, is a member of the Executive Committee of International Business Machines. Harold Brown, our new Secretary of Defense, is a director of IBM and chair, he is the chairman of its audit committee. Patricia Harris, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, is a director of IBM. She advises the company on executive compensation. Griffin Bell and Charles Kerbo, the, uh, Bell is now our Attorney General, and Charles Kerbo is the main advisor, the intimate advisor to Jimmy Carter, have a law firm in Atlanta, Georgia, of King and Spaulding, and they represent IBM in Georgia. And Georgia is a big state with military contracts and IBM computer machines, including those computers at the Germ Warfare Center that are involved with Legionnaire disease or the swine flu or any other diseases we have, and also the garden plot, the martial law plan, and the computers for sending out SWAT teams and military control of local police and SWAT and National Guard is in Georgia. These rep men represent the IBM locally in Georgia. Governor Carter um, was responsible for getting IBM installations into Atlanta, Georgia. He was, as the governor, he won a large IBM installation in Atlanta, and after it was in there, then the business for IBM went to the law offices of Griffin Bell and Charles Kerbo. Warren Christopher, who now becomes Under Secretary of State, is a business partner, a law partner of O'Melveny and Myers in Los Angeles, who are representatives of the IBM sales and interest in the Far West. Christopher, is, the Under Secretary of State, is an attorney for IBM. And he's testified as an expert witness against the government, defending IBM against the government, and now he's the Under Secretary of State and our Secretary of State is on the Executive Committee of IBM. Carter's first choice for Tech Secretary of Treasury was Irving Shapiro, who's a director of IBM, and Carter's first choice for Secretary of Commerce, Jane Cahill Pfeiffer, is a former Vice President of IBM. You can see there that this is a very important uh, stance that Jimmy Carter has taken the first month of his in setting up a new cabinet that the Secretary of the State, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, the Attorney General, the personal advisor to the President, the Under Secretary of State, the applications they did not accept it, they refused it for the Secretary of the Treasury and the Secretary of Commerce were all from the Board of Directors of one corporation, the IBM. Uh, William Sapphire said Carter's talent search may have just been a media manipulation when he told us that he would have a broad search for talent. He might have known all along who he wanted on his cabinet and who he had to repay. The new attorney general himself now will have to excuse uh, himself from this large antitrust case that's been going on all this time because of his links to the IBM. But the problem is that the lawyers under him and his staff will want favors from the Attorney General, they'll want recommendations, they'll want appointments to a certain judgeships or when they get out to other jobs, and it will affect their relationship because if they go against the IBM in the Justice Department and remain neutral or objective as the antitrust case comes in, 
they will anger probably the new attorney general and uh, Griffin Bell, who has direct links to the IBM through his law firm. It, it will affect the investigation because it's hard to remain objective when your boss has direct links to the IBM. The general counsel for IBM, the international business machine, is the former attorney general under Lyndon Johnson, Nicholas Katzenbach. He's one of the men that was responsible for the initial bugging of Martin Luther King. He's the person who got the memo to um, uh, the orders to bug the critics of the Warren Commission hearings. He's the gentleman who was uh, ordered in Texas to destroy the body of Lee Harvey Oswald because they didn't have the expertise or the legal right to do it from Washington, D.C. when Gerald Ford was sitting at the Warren Commission meetings and they had to destroy that body immediately after the assassination, practically after the first meeting of the commission in January of 64. Because there was something on that body, the nation couldn't see, they'd have another shock. The memo was to go to Nicholas Katzenbach. He's Lyndon Johnson. He was Lyndon Johnson's attorney general. He's now the attorney for IBM, uh, working against the Justice Department and defending them. And Katzenbach's right-hand man is Warren Christopher, and he was selected uh, by IBM. He worked with IBM, too. And Director Cyrus Vance, working with uh, Christopher, uh, does not bring out or is not mentioned to us. I mentioned that as he works with the Secretary of State, he's under Secretary of State, it has not been publicly brought out that Mr. Christopher is the same person who sponsored the very plans for the Army secret files, the massive files, the dossiers, the computer files of civilians during the 1960s. Now those files were made of almost a million Americans and the files were moved down to Georgia. This was the garden plot that Ronald Reagan talked about at his meetings in California. He said, if people knew that I was attending these meetings, they would say I was overthrowing the country and having martial law. Uh, so that you take it out of the uh, hands of uh, Ronald Reagan or John Connolly, and it's in Jimmy Carter's hands. The state of Georgia has the Command Center for Diseases and Swine Flu, as I say, it is the headquarters for the martial law plans, the National Guard, and the police, and the IBM computers are there for domestic control of SWAT teams and sending out National Guards and the military in case we need them. And as they said in Los Angeles, the SWAT teams are for food riots and there's not enough food to go around in this country. Um, there's plenty of land to grow the food, but the SWAT teams are in preparation to get anybody who rides and doesn't have enough food. So that we have this Warren Christopher, who is one of the people that sponsored the Army secret plans and had the files and dossiers and the computer files on us that were made through the computers of IBM and this type of computer operation working for the military, who is now uh, under Secretary of State. And we have Nicholas Katzenbach, who was for bugging and blackmailing and part of Lyndon Johnson's secret police state um, representing IBM in this particular suit. Uh, I'm not sounding very optimistic about the Carter administration. I guess uh, it's good to get off Jerry Ford's back for a while and get on to Jimmy Carter, but the more I read about uh, IBM and Trilateral Commission, the more obscene it gets and the more I really realize we've been had. I have one sweatshirt I wear all the time that says, Do you believe the Warren Commission? And I'm going to have one made by the same people in Colorado that says, I didn't vote for him. Uh, meaning Jimmy Carter, of course, I couldn't vote for him because I knew of his membership on the Trilateral Commission selected by David Rockefeller, but I had no idea in my wildest dreams that if he became President of the United States, he would select a cabinet that was so stacked with people from the international business machine at a time when the antitrust suit is going on. And I want to tell you a little bit about that company now that you know that your Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, your President's closest advisor, your Under Secretary of State, are all affiliated with that corporation. Let me tell you a little bit about the corporation in case you don't know and about the suit. There's been a complaint that you can't split IBM in half and make two major companies because if they were altered in any way, they'd raise their prices and with the high prices and cost of living, 
uh, the corporations would fight, fight. They don't want it split up because to split it up would cost them money and then in turn would cost the consumer money. So the logic of many people is let one person own it all rather than the double the price of computers and between two people. And they also say if you split it into five small IBM companies and break uh, the 12 companies that are suing IBM, if you break them into five more or 12 more, you'll have 12 more monsters instead of one. And so you may as well put it in the hands of uh, one company. That's the logic of, of breaking Germany after World War I into 12 provinces and saying, well, if you have 12 dictators instead of one Fuhrer, uh, you know, they're all the same, so you may as well have one Fuhrer dictating the policy. I, I have no answer for that. I don't know whether one Hitler would be any different than the eight military dictators in South America that I talked about last week that are putting the, in the policies of Adolf Hitler right now. Whether it's one or eight, I don't really know. But uh, bigness seems to be cheaper, and cheaper is what people like. They relate to money and not to actually what is happening or the right of 12 other companies to remain in business. And if it's cheaper for the American people, then they sit by and accept that. Uh, the suggestion has been made that short of nationalizing IBM, there's no way to control it, and there's no relief in sight. The IBM makes $5.4 million every day after taxes, which is a staggering figure to any person. And uh, the question is, should it be nationalized and then that profit put back to the country? If the United States government ideally took over IBM uh, with those profits, we'd have $5 million a day to help for a lot of domestic programs and low-cost housing and so forth. But right now the profit goes back to a handful of people. When Nicholas Katzenbach, um, the former attorney general, was asked if the government could uh, prosecute IBM in the antitrust case, did they have the resources to prosecute the IBM case, Katzenbach answered back, and he's the attorney for them now, he said, it's strange to think that a private corporation may have more resources than the government of the United States. And uh, when you think that three or five or seven people are working for Jimmy Carter now and that they have more resources than the government, that's pretty heavy. And I do want to go into a couple of tricks that IBM has pulled in, re in regards to this litigation to show that they do have the knowledge and the money to pull some pretty funny tricks. The IBM lawyers uh, are heavily paid. They pull up in large limousines wherever the, the case is under litigation at the various cities. The government lawyers have to work on a per diem salary of like $25. They stay in the cheapest hotels. The IBM people pull up in limousines. The lawyers get about 250000 a year. They stay in mansions and expensive hotels. And the Justice Department lawyers are just little schleppers with hardly any money in their pocket and dragging themselves along. So it's hard to get uh, lawyers to carry these cases if they have a really sharp lawyer that swings to the other side. The IBM can always hire them, and the $25 day DM is over. The top lawyers, as I say, in the Justice Department get around $37,000 a year. The IBM lawyers get around $200,000 a year and $100 an hour. When the case first opened up, the antitrust case, there was a judge, Philip Neville, from Minnesota, that was hearing the pre-trial procedures. He's referred to in New Times article on IBM as being the late judge. That's about the 17th judge on an important case that died right in the middle of the controversial case. And so I'll have to do a little research into why Judge Philip Neville died at this time. But at the, when the case first opened, it was necessary to have two or three depositions for each of the companies competing in the electronic data business. And it turned out that then there were 2,700 competing companies with IBM, 2,700 competing companies. So what the, the ask for these depositions, you need several for the judges and several for the companies and the court. So they, uh, it was impossible, almost impossible, to uh, get these depositions out in such large numbers. So they asked for written questionnaires that were circulated instead, instead of these formal legal depositions. And what came back from IBM when the, in the companies when they asked for these questionnaires began what was a mammoth paper operation, and they filled 34 boxes and filing cabinets, and they created the work of 100 ordinary lawsuits right from the beginning. 
The U.S. versus IBM involves billions and billions of dollars. The future of the computer industry is at stake. And the judge ordered certain documents turned over to him in 1972. It's a very important case. And IBM refused to turn over these documents. So the judge, to hasten the case, set a fine of $150,000 a day until IBM turned over the necessary uh, cases, the law papers that they needed for the case. And so they went to an appeals court and refused to turn them over. So this was in 1972, they asked for these papers. They went to an appeals court in 73 and were turned down in 1973. They went to the Supreme Court in May of 1974 and the judge ordered them to surrender. But in the meantime, they, three years had passed. And also in the meantime, they had a candidate who would have these board members from IBM um, on the in the White House and on the uh, legal side, he could make a lot of decisions or influence. Jimmy Carter's in a position now. They stalled this three years and uh, the, uh, the 150000 a day wasn't anything. They objected to paying that and they took the Supreme Court. So that brought the case up to 1974 when it originally began in 1969 and also now a judge was dead. The IBM lawyers caused endless delays. They began to harass their competitors and people were saying in Washington that there was no justice and there was incompetence. Then they began what's called the Great Xerox Disaster in 1974, in late 74, after they began uh, to turn over papers. The Justice Department said, we need 10,000 pages of key documents from your computer department from the IBM. And in order to have these 10 pages, if you know how law cases run, they needed two for the judge, two for IBM to keep, and two for the lawyer's own, own use. So that's 60,000 pages of documents, and you have a running list of 1,200, 2,700 copies. So what the IBM people did, they made photocopies in their storage center in New York City, but the Justice Department had to have their paper put in a Xerox machine in Arlington, Virginia. And when they did, the paper came out ill illegible, pardon me, it was out of order, they couldn't read it, it was fuzzy, and the 10,000 pages multiplied um, six times for 2,700 people were not in order, and they threw them all out, and the core of the government case became a giant jigsaw puzzle, and it took weeks to get together, and this is like the Department of Dirty Tricks, they were uh, suspect of, of making this paper a disaster. The papers were fuzzy. It was second or third generation paper. It was illegible. The cause of the bad paper was never found and the trial then was postponed for three months while the Justice Department had to put together 60,000 sheets times 2,700 uh, uh, clients that were involved in this. So 1974-75 rolls around. That's the end of 74 and David Rockefeller had conveniently discovered Jimmy Carter, the governor of Georgia, to run for president, and IBM had discovered Jimmy Carter. Uh, in some way, uh, he had brought IBM into Georgia, so he and his law office was involved with IBM. And now we're up to 1975, and little happy Jimmy is selected, as I put in my article about Richard Nixon in 1946, when uh, Howard Hughes and the Bank of America called Nixon, and I said Nixon was recognized in 1946 to run against uh, Congressman Voorhees. Uh, that was the beginning of his career. Around this time period, uh, Jimmy Carter was recognized, and IBM was firmly entrenched in Georgia with Carter's advisors, his law offices, and with the governor himself bringing them down to Georgia. Well, the IBM had another paper disaster in an earlier one uh, where they were asked to turn over some decisional documents the justice department to in order to prosecute this antitrust case said we want these decisional documents so then they turned over to them all of their papers their christmas cards their mailing addresses and if you can dig this figure because this just tells you the kind of people working with jimmy carter and running our government the ibm then turned over 17 million pages and said here to the justice department take everything go through the decisional papers, take what you want. And they delivered 18 tons of paper, which is enough to fill a filing cabinet two miles long. 
They asked for decisional documents and they got everything and this was described as another paper disaster. The first one was the great Xerox disaster because it came out fuzzy and then there was a paper disaster. And then the third disaster which really shows you the caliber of, of this corporation and the people running the Justice Department and the way the wheels of justice go slowly was that a Minneapolis computer manufacturer decided that they would sue IBM separately. Uh, the little David taking on Goliath but not uh, quite successful. Uh, they ended up successful but the Justice Department lost. And this time they got in the act just about when the Justice Department was doing it and they had charged that IBM was selling all the hard machines, the paper and soft, the ink and the soft part of the machines and the services. And they claimed that IBM was a corporation set up to drive out every other computer company in the United States. And they objected that they had what they called an educational allowance and they gave away to universities computers because then the university was indebted to them, used their repair service, used their cards, used all the equipment from IBM and they gave it to the universities free and the universities became indebted. Then the other computer companies had nowhere to sell their IBM machines. If a company couldn't afford to buy it, they gave it to them under an educational allowance. So a company called Control Data Corporation went to work to fight the giant IBM. At the same time, the Justice Department was doing. They took 10 full-time lawyers, 20 part-time lawyers, 120 paralegal help. They went through 40 million documents of IBM files, 40 million documents. And the Justice Department had 17 million pages of its own. And then they went ahead and they indexed and microfilmed between 80,000 and 100,000 files into an automated retrieval system and they got three million dollars to put into a data bank and they fed it their material for this lawsuit against IBM into the data bank and as I say meanwhile the government had its 17 million documents and they had 40 million documents deluged with this massive amount of material the Justice Department decided to combine their material with Control Data Corporation it made sense both of them were suing in an antitrust case, they would use the same documents and the machinery. But the IBM people got uh, wind of the fact that the Control Data Corporation was working with the Justice Department, and uh, they decided the best way to handle this was to divide and conquer. Uh, the government, Depart government Justice Department was suing IBM. This other company was suing IBM. Meanwhile, the United States government was buying IBM machines at the same time that they were suing them in the antitrust. The Navy alone uses 50,000 computers. And they rent to other companies and uh, break people in using their machinery. And while the antitrust has been suing them, uh, the government has been buying and using their computers. By 1971, these two joint efforts took place, the Justice Department and the Control Data Corporation from Minneapolis in 1971 joined forces to take on this huge monster that Nicholas Katzenbach felt was really bigger than the United States. He said that um, he wondered that a private corporation could have more resources than the United States government. So on a historic evening, January the 12th, 1973, that was just four years ago, in 1973, the IBM company met with the Control Data Corporation, the lawyers got together, and they took every document or printout that the Control Data Corporation had. But they had joined with the Justice Department, so they had also the Justice Department papers. And they took all their magnetic tapes into trucks, and they went with a shredders into acid baths. They took it to a place where they could dump all of this material, and they there's talk in Minneapolis that if they had set fire to all these documents that night of the documents the print out the millions of papers 40 million documents and files and all the information that was in these data banks that um, it would have set a, a bonfire over Minneapolis it would have eliminated all of Minneapolis but instead they put it in these I guess dug caves or whatever and poured uh, dye over it acid and went up in a fizzle and all the working papers that the government had with the Control Data Corporation 
no longer existed. The Justice Department didn't have a partner, and all of this was burned. All of this automated paper, the index cards, the information that the Justice Department needed was burned. And what did the IBM people do? They paid off the Control Data Corporation a hundred million dollars, and the government keeps buying the IBM machines and using them every day. The uh, IBM company paid $100 million, which is more than the federal government can even compete with. We're not talking about huge corporations like the Hughes Organization, the ITT, and the Exxon Corporation. We're talking about one company that makes computers for our defense and for our banking system and control of our money and lives and our police states and calls out our armies, National Guards, and so forth. They paid $100 million, and they paid $15 million in legal fees to those uh, poor paralegals that work for Control Data Corporation. They got $15 million in legal fees and were paid off, and they paid $16 million for their service bureau that was putting out the information. The IBM subsidiary was taking in, at that time, $63 million a year in revenues, and they could afford to dump it. Then they went to the judge in the case, Judge David D. Dedelstein, Dedelstein, and he was furious. And he said, I had ordered IBM, uh, in this case, not to destroy any papers among the 40 million documents. I told them not to destroy any. Control Data Corporation had that many documents in their hands, 40 million documents, the Justice Department, 17 million, and they were combining. And they were plowing through these massive amount of papers after they were given them out of order and some weren't clear and spent all this time and years siphoning them and appealing in the courts to stall this until Jimmy Carter was president of the United States. The judge said, I ordered you not to destroy this evidence. And then the lawyers for IBM simply said these were work product papers and they wrote them off as work product papers, uh, working papers. And so the Justice Department had no uh, way of using what the Control Data Corporation had, and how could they pay $100 million for this kind of information? Uh, I heard the Justice Department has $100 million to pay off uh, for secret operations, but they can't do this all the time. There's a new article out, I think it's in New Times, on the burglary of the Hughes office on Romaine Street, and uh, Chief of Police Ed Davis offered a million dollars for those people who burglarized the office to return the papers, no questions asked. And in the article, the question came up, well, uh, why would Ed Davis, the chief of police of L.A., even as a front for the used people of the CIA, offer a million dollars for these papers? And the remark was that the CIA has a fund of $100 million to cover this kind of an operation. Well, evidently, the IBM has, too. And... Um, it's a disgraceful situation. It's disgraceful because our new president of the United States, again, uh, to repeat it, has appointed Cyrus Vance, the Secretary of State, who's a member of the executive committee of this monster, the IBM. Our Secretary of Defense, Hal Brown, is chairman of the Audit Committee of IBM. Patricia Hurst, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, chairs um, the director, advises the company on executive compensation. Griffin Bell and Charles Kerbo uh, of the Atlanta office of King and Spaulding represent IBM in Georgia with their huge military and Lockheed installations for the security of the United States. And also Jimmy Carter had wanted uh, the top uh, Secretary of Treasury, the Director of IBM, uh, Irving Shapiro, and Secretary of Commerce, Jane Pfeiffer, former Vice President. Now they turned down these appointments for reasons of their own choice. But maybe they felt that if there were 10 or 12 people from IBM of this caliber on the cabinet, then all of them would be investigated, and maybe it was better just to stay with what they had and run with that. Well, I think next week, while we're getting into Jimmy Carter, we'll go back uh, in, into the Trilateral Commission, which I did before he was elected uh, President of the United States. I've talked about before on KLRB, but because this new article came out in the Washington Post about the great conspiracy that uh, fills everybody's fantasies, I think next week on KLRB I'll talk at great length about the Trilateral Commission and David Rockefeller, and we'll talk about the opinion of the Birch Society, the John Birch Society, and their fears of Rockefeller's 
and their hold over the government of world fascism and the fears that the National Labor Caucus, one from the right and one from the left, and their feels, fears of the Rockefellers and international fascism, and then give my view of the two groups or the organizations, say the far right and the far left, and where I think they are right about their worries about Rockefeller and Jimmy Carter, and where I differ with their opinions, but I definitely am concerned about that president of the United States. It could be that that little walk he took uh, from the Capitol building to the White House, strolling hand in hand with his wife, was because he knew there are no more assassins on the road, that the Rockefellers now have their man in office and we don't need any more political assassinations because the White House is secured for four years, eight years, 12 years, how many years, and how far is this going to go if he has the arrogance to make the appointments he's making now, how much further can he go, and how much is he under the control of Peter Byrne, the psychoanalyst, and how much free choice did we ever have to have an election of a president since 1960. That's it for Dialogue Conspiracy. We'll talk more about this next week. This is Mae Russell in Carmel, California.